Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Power. I'm the editor of Supply Professional Magazine. Welcome to today's webinar, Strengthen Your DC, How the Right Enabling Technology Can Help You Handle Volatility and Change. We're joined today by Peter Zielinski, Senior Supply Chain Consultant, Bertrand Martel, Canadian Country Manager at Barcoding Canada, and Rock Gilbo, uh, Channel Business Manager at Honeywell. For today's webinar, we'll aim for between 45 minutes to an hour. If you have any questions, please type them into your question box in your control panel. And we will endeavor to answer them at the end of the webinar. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to Peter. Thank you. Well, we'll give you a few faces to go along with the names. My name is Peter Zielinski. I'm the uh, Senior Supply Chain Consultant at Barcoding. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the joy of uh, what's happening around our current environment, both within the DC and in the general world. I'm sure you recognize the uh, illustration of COVID-19 on the first slide. Uh, the ongoing pa pandemic is a backdrop to our conversations for today. Uh, we've all passed the panic buying stage of the pandemic, and we're currently experiencing the joys of working from home and adjusting to the emerging normal and the 90% economy. Um, as we are working on deconfinement and coming out, we're all adapting to the health and safety aspects, both in our everyday activities and in the work environment. Uh, supply and demand have been increasingly volatile across Canada. In the DC and the warehouse, worker safety concerns have led to a greater awareness of how closely and how often people interact with each other and with the environment. So we're adapting. Uh, we're adding physical barriers between workstations, more frequent sanitizing of surfaces, uh, we're putting physical distancing markers on the floor and assembly areas, and there's an increased focus on worker and customer well-being. Uh, contactless transactions, otherwise known as reducing the touches, are required uh, to reduce the opportunity for contagion to spread. The impacts of COVID-19 have affected revenues, costs, and activity across all industries, from the impacts of stay at home, delays in shipments, order cancellations, demand spikes and drops. But it's interesting. Uh, what we're seeing as a result of this black swan event is that the supply chain has been stress tested. Portions of it are in disarray and trying to recover, but this has led to an acceleration of all the trends in the supply chain that have been going on for the past few years as companies focus on improving their flexibility, robustness, and resilience in these highly adaptive times. So if you are taking a look at a media discussion of uh, supply chain and virus uh, over the past few years, uh, you notice that it starts off at about zero and then suddenly spikes um, at the start of this year. Um, the supply chain, or rather the supply system, however, is not broken, but the bullwhip effects caused by the initial confinement are still resonating. Uh, the impacts on businesses have been profound. We're still talking now about the 90% economy. Uh, at the end of 2019, we were going strong and expecting a bumper crop year. Health and safety concerns still dominate and every interaction or potential interaction. Um, this changes the customer experience at all levels. Uh, we've got the same concerns at home and at work, but with different levels of risk and different risk factors. Um, the impact of these changes in consumer behavior have rippled up and down the various supply systems, stress testing them. And you'll probably notice that the food supply system saw the greatest impacts. Um, I think it was described as a seven days of back-to-back -back Thanksgivings in that first week as people started to stock up. And immediately after that, we had the uh, restaurant and hospitality industry pretty much drying up. Um, we experienced a lot of supply chain issues of too much food in the wrong places. Um, just a quick highlight on that, I just came off of the uh, GS1 Connect conference and they were talking about the fact that we do not have interoperable food systems. The retail supply chain and the food service supply chains are not set up with the same standards for labeling, packaging, and product information. And that makes them in non, they just don't inter interoperate very well. The retail food chain is fully digitized using GS1 standards and the food service chain is not. And that's just one of the things that they can work on to improve. So if we take a look kind of across Canada, um, I'm going to show you a slide from the uh, Canadian airports showing the impact of COVID-19 on their operations as of May. 
Um, if you'll notice, total employments are down drastically. Passenger traffic is, of course, down drastically. Uh, operating revenues are down by $2.2 billion, and yet operating expenses are increasing. This is kind of a typical experience for all non-essential businesses. Orders and shipments are down, revenues are down, um, operating expenses are climbing. Uh, essential businesses, on the other hand, have seen just the opposite. Anybody executing e-commerce fulfillment, uh, their orders are up, their revenues are up, although their rate of fulfillment and actually reaching the customer can vary. Uh, you've all experienced the impact of COMED on uh, the Canada Post, for example. Parcels can be delayed by days, if not weeks, right now. Um, but due to COVID, operating expenses are still climbing at a higher rate than expected, even as revenues increase for those essential businesses. Again, Walmart, Amazon uh, are prime examples of people benefiting uh, from the, the economic impact, impact of COVID because they were prepared uh, to switch to e-commerce and fulfill that. So needless to say, we are in highly adaptive times. Deconfinement is bringing us into a new emerging normal. And my question to you as an audience is, how are you adapting? Is your business robust enough to weather those changes? Is it resilient enough to rebound and capitalize on those new opportunities? Peter, this is Rock. Can you explain to us why the, the cost of operations are going up even if the rate of business is not or is going down? Sure. Um, just g getting your workforce ready for COVID is adding an increase in just PPE, you know, personal protective equipment and adaptations there. Uh, but that's kind of a baseline expense. What's happening due to the surge is um, companies are throwing more bodies um, at more business that's happening faster and changing more rapidly. And as a result, they're making more mistakes and more errors. Um, they're getting um, a lot more business, but they're not doing it as efficiently as they could be. So their operating expenses, their cost per unit is actually going up because of the surge. And if you're not experiencing the surge, if your business is down, your operating expenses are going up because you've got no incoming revenue and you still have to keep the lights on and you still have to maintain contact with your furloughed employees or your employees who are at work right now um, and keep them busy and keep them operating and adapting your environment and hopefully looking ahead. So the operating expenses have increased across the board as a result. Now that doesn't mean we're not combating that, but um, that's what we've noticed so far. Well, it's a, it's a definitely a period of adaptation to this new reality. And that's what we're seeing as well at Honeywell. Very true. Um, we can skip ahead two slides. Again, the phrase I like applying here is highly adaptive times. Um, I'd prefer that to a black swan event, for example. Um, things that we're seeing in these highly adaptive times, we're talking already about the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity, the amb ambiguity of what's going on, um, otherwise known as VUCA. We've stress tested the supply chain. A lot of things have changed as far as the customer experience is concerned. Customers and retailers want a contactless experience. They want to reduce the number of touches and they're opting for um, buy online, pick up in store. Um, shopping and delivery services like Instacart or buying online and shipping to home. Um, fulfillment is shifting from e-commerce and the DC to sometimes in-store fulfillment. And we see this stabilizing as time goes on, not rolling back. Um, over time, we've seen an increase in e-commerce and in-store fulfillment and on-demand purchasing. Um, this just accelerated during COVID because everybody was at home and no one could get out to go shopping. So the best thing to do is get used to getting online. And people that previously had not been candidates for buying online suddenly were. And as they get used to it, they're going to start to expect it and things will shift. Um, health and safety concerns have been creating new requirements for social distancing in the workplace and a lack of demand and supply visibility, which was always there has increased because all forecasts are wrong. What I mean by that is most forecasts are designed 
around historical data. Um, most DCs, most supply chains have what we call one up, one down visibility. They've got visibility to their immediate suppliers and they've got visibility to their immediate customers based upon historical orders. Well, with a black swan event, all of your order information becomes completely irrelevant. And being able to see demand only in terms of orders means that you can't see demand at the shelf. And being able to see supply only from your immediate suppliers means you can't see where their supply, supply chain is at. You have no visibility on product coming into the supply chain and heading your way. So you can't respond to it, you can't react to it, and it blows any chance of being resilient. COVID is definitely exposing all of the weaknesses in that supply chain. Um, DCs are starting to adapt to smaller and more frequent orders. And because of that, um, poor visibility within the warehouse has a higher impact because it leads to phantom inventory. You see the product when it's in stock until you go actually look, looking for it to ship it. And then because you don't have good visibility over your operations, that order may, may have been picked and allocated for someone else at the time that you were looking to allocate that order to a different order. So overall, what we're seeing is not so much a change in the direction of technology and digitalization, but rather an acceleration of all of these current trends. Um, right now, we're seeing in real time how businesses respond as we undergo deconfinement. Um, as, the flatten, as the curve flattens in some regions, um, we're seeing staggered deconfinement and business is coming back online. And businesses that thrive under these highly adaptive times exhibit flexibility, robustness, and resilience. What we're seeing is the emergence of highly creative people and companies is really what we're seeing. And, and some, of the, some of the solutions that they come up with are, are quite unique and original. So it's, it's interesting to see how companies and people react. Very true, very true. Um, now stores are reopening, consumers are returning, and the health and safety concerns are at the forefront. Uh, stores are setting hours aside for seniors and other at-risk shoppers. Uh, we've seen plexiglass shields at the checkout to enable physical distancing. And we've seen stickers on the floor that not only direct traffic, but allow shoppers, consumers to stay separated. We're seeing a lot of things um, that within the DC that are very similar, um, implementing those same types of adaptions for the health and safety of their workers. Uh, one interesting thing that's happened um, due to COVID and due to all of the online shopping and the uh, differences in supply and demand is that goods available is now more important than the brand. It's not so much that it's gold metal flower, it just ha happens to have flower on the shelf, you're gonna pick what's available as opposed to waiting around for a brand. Um, we're seeing businesses actually reduce the number of SKUs so that they can keep product on the shelf to satisfy their customers, even though they don't have the same variety that they used to have. Thanks to the Amazon effect, customers want more visibility on their product and faster availability of the product, whether it's online or in store. Again, those e-commerce trends have accelerated and more ordering is happening online and via apps. Some stores, some enterprises are actually using the app in store to place your order um, so that they can package it and have it ready for you at the checkout. And thanks to Amazon, the expectations for two-day shipping has now turned into next-day shipping. And it's expected to become same-day shipping as we return to that new emerging normal once the postal services start coming back online and get fully operational. This is putting even more stress on DCs as shipments switch from parcels to pallets. They're looking for automation to add resilience and workforce flexibility. And they're adding things like, you know, elevated temperature monitoring into the process. So how can the right technology help you handle volatility and change? Well, one thing to think about is adding operational intelligence to your operation. A little redundancy there. Um, this is something that Honeywell has built into their platform. And one of the things I want to bring to your attention is not only are these devices being used to execute and direct tasks, such as picking, put away, printing tasks, and receiving activities, you know, putting a mobile device on someone's hand to either scan barcodes or pick up product. All of these devices are also connected to the web, and they're making use of that Internet of Technology to do more with what they have. If we use the information that's available to us from those smart devices, we can do a lot of things. 
that help make the environment safer for our workers, enable them to perform better, keep those devices up and running and know where they are at all times, adjust how the performance in the warehouse happens because we have complete visibility over that activity. And being able to manage and standardize those devices as required to maintain the services to keep them operational. If you take a look at what we can do just by knowing where a device is, who's touching it, and what transactions are involved, we can start adding advanced intelligence to that process to allow you to adapt it to make it more efficient, more accurate, and make use of that connected technology to leverage that platform for additional insights from all of those Internet of Things devices. And that's how Honeywell provides their operational intelligence. And you can even add to that new features uh, such as uh, reading the distance between people, counting how many people are in a given space, and even scheduling uh, wipe downs of the device, physical wipe down, I mean, uh, cleaning the device if the devices or the handheld computers are being shared. So all of this is available through this, uh, this feature. Yeah, all these added health and safety features are important to maintaining the security and safety of your workforce. Um, that idea of having a cleaning alert to make sure that your device gets properly um, decommissioned before you hand it off to the next worker, getting it cleaned and sanitized for them to make use of it, and then doing check-in, check-out to make sure that you know who's using that device at any given time. All these things are important. Now, one of the things we alluded to earlier was that the uh, top challenges and pain points for DCs haven't really changed. And, and let's be honest, most distribution centers are still behind the technology curve. They're running an industry 2.0 model operation in a 4.0 world, and they need to eliminate the air gaps between the activities and the information transfers to reduce travel time, and they just don't have the tools because they're still using paper to handle a lot of their transactions. These challenges have not changed since 2019. They've only become more important. And we've seen an acceleration in the needs for digital transformation within the supply chain. They need to be able to automate to allow them to scale without increasing manpower. So let's talk a look at some of the uh, market challenges that are happening. So if you're a DC, there's a high demand for industrial real estate. Um, a shrinking labor supply, and we're anticipating a potential economic downturn. And this is according to Phoenix Logistics back in Q4. So the market basically said DCs are extremely in demand, but we don't have a whole lot of places to put them. Our operational challenges haven't really changed. We're still dealing with people, process, technology, and data, how to optimize, make these more efficient, more accurate, and more connected. But 49% of all operations are still using manual processes in the DC and in the warehouse. And that's according to modern material handling. That means half of you have automation and mobile devices, and half of you are still using um, paper to wave out activities. If you're using manual processes to wave out a task, you have to wait until that task is complete before you hear anything about it. You have no ability to redirect that information or redirect that information or that energy into something more important. You can't even recall that task without some manual process to get it back. Warehouses using manual processes are extremely limited in how flexible and how resilient they can be. They can be robust. They can weather change without adapting to it. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to profit from that. Under those conditions, the only response a DC can make to increase demand is either more overtime more delays, and more errors in shipping. Temp workers often compound the problem, requiring additional training when resources are already stretched thin. Peter Bertrand speaking. Uh, you know, we see in uh, distribution centers, uh, you know, potentially half of the operations uh, automated. Do you have some statistics uh, on, uh, you know, the number of distribution centers that are really fully uh, automated and optimized? That can be a loaded question because your automation can be anything from um, putting mobile devices in, in people's hands so that they get directed tasks to you know, full on uh, automated storage and retrieval systems and goods to people. Um, what we do have some data around is um, given 
what their operations are. Um, how many of them are using current technology versus how many are using outdated or legacy technology? Okay, because what we're seeing is, uh, you know, you had the first wave of automation mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, regular handheld, and what we see is, uh, you know, potentially to to increase productivity by using uh, other means like uh, voice speaking or RFID. So what we see in this is, is you know potential use of different technologies to try to arrive to that, you know, uh, ideal full automation. Uh, this is true. Um, I want to bring up a couple of different terms here that may or may not be familiar to the audience. Uh, a work, uh, warehouse execution system versus a warehouse management system. Um, that warehouse execution system includes things like automated storage and retrieval systems. Uh, robots, automation, conveyor systems, and that sort of thing. And what we formally think about as a, a warehouse management system is primarily a person or a, a people-oriented environment where people are picking, putting away, and, and handling materials. So these two things often work in conjunction where certain tasks are pushed off to the warehouse management system while others are automated by the uh, warehouse execution systems. I mean, it all depends on what optimizes things for that particular operation. Uh, looking at the mobile devices and the, the warehouse management systems, a lot of them are run using rugged mobilized computers. Um, you know, current technology use back in 2019, half of them were being run using uh, consumer grade devices. Um, and the operating systems un that were being supported were, you know, roughly half Windows, a third Android, and a remainder in iOS. And there's a challenge here um, in that Windows operating systems for mobile devices are essentially going offline as of 2020. Um, they've reached their end of life, they are no longer going to be supported, and uh, systems are slowly converting over um, as they reach end of life uh, to Android uh, because that platform allows them a lot more functionality and a lot more adaptability. Um, we're seeing a complete flip. If you take a look inside that, that uh, orange rectangle I've got up there, for 2020, we anticipate those numbers to completely flip where Android is now 51% or more, and Windows operating systems kind of start to drop off. And again, the reason for that is that end of life issue. But there are some huge bonuses to switching over to Android. A lot of those Windows platforms were supporting TE environments, your standard green screen. Um, they're very linear in mind, they're not very adaptive, and they're single function. Follow this, do that, scan this, go to the next task. Uh, with an Android-based operating system, um, you can get the same type of multifunctionality that you're getting out of a smartphone. So that you've got more capabilities to do uh, more things with less technology investment. Um, they can use those hands-free devices for visual and voice-directed work. Um, and they can improve the user experience with features like push to talk. And they can also add those operational intelligent features that simply were not available on the older platforms. Another thing that's important about this is those 50% that don't have any mobility whatsoever, they now get to leapfrog over the legacy systems and jump directly to Android and take advantage of all of those um, current features and deploy the same apps on all of their Android devices using Honeywell's Mobility Edge, regardless of form factor. So in the past, um, every form factor, whether it was a tablet or a mobile device or a handheld, um, the experience had to be shaped for that specific device. And now um, you can actually deploy the same app to all levels of that device, regardless of form factor, because they're all running on the same Android platform. So now you can put an app with a mobile device in someone's hand. You can put that same app as a wearable to optimize a picking operation. Um, you can take that same app and put it onto a fork truck in a tablet mode so that they can be hands-free and look up and pay attention to what they're doing and not have to uh, focus as much on something that's in their hands while they're driving. So a lot of interesting things that have happened um, around migration in the past year and going forward into 2020. So for companies that have technology or who are getting into technology, um, what are their priorities within the supply chain for 2020? 
Well, DCs are still focused on the return on investment, according to High Jump. Um, operational savings, profits and revenue, order accuracy, cost per unit, customer experience, all of those things are still a, a, a strong focus. And this hasn't changed much over the past 10 years. But their immediate priorities uh, for 2020, their top three, are supply chain planning, sourcing and procurement, and innovation. And they're focused on those three things in, in a very interesting way. Uh, they're looking at improving the process and adopting more and more best practices. And they're looking at implementing new technologies and capabilities to make better use of their people and better use of their data across the enterprise. You're seeing this in the DC. Um, you're seeing this within the, um, the warehouse and manufacturing. You're seeing it across the entire enterprise. Within the supply chain, um, in order to get into industry 4.0 and take advantage of that, you really do need to update your technology. And these, these um, priorities are solid across the supply chain. And their goal is to be able to react at the speed of business to improve that customer experience. So kind of as we move forward, let's talk about some of the top features of a successful DC. What makes them flexible, robust, and resilient? Well, let's talk about those three terms for a moment so we know where what we're referring to. Uh, being flexible means that you can modify your current directions and adapt to change. Being robust means you can endure change without adapting. That's possible with a large enterprise that's mission critical. But if they wanna be resilient, they need to be able to survive despite the great impact of change, such as this black swan event from COVID-19. The top features of a successful DC haven't really changed. Um, adopting the right technology enables DC operations to be more efficient, more accurate, and more connected. But more and more functionality and capability is being brought to the mobility edge where work happens. Successful DCs are more flexible, remain to be robust, and they're more resilient as a result. And those key distribution center trends right now, even under COVID, are worker well being technological transformation, increasing transparency and visibility, and a strong support for e-commerce. Um, according to a Tuesday's keynote speech at the GS1 Connect Digital Edition this week, organizations that had the strongest culture of safety and healthcare saw less impact due to COVID-19 because they took care of their employees and their customers and they extended that culture. Resilience has a huge culture component. Having the technology to support those operations is also important, but they do a couple of things across the board um, as a successful DC using these, these trends and following these trends. One thing they have is visibility to the order from the initial entry through the acceptance by the customer. That requires a lot of transparency and visibility. Uh, they're using their technology and their workers to do efficient receipt of expected orders and customer returns. And they're directing put away and automating their cross dock capability. And they're making use of mobile devices uh, for accurate and efficient fulfillment. And they have a well-trained, well-connected and empowered workforce that is focused on continuous improvement. And a lot of this is possible uh, because of the pillars that their DC is built on. A modern DC is making use of the cloud. Cloud-based operations enables a level of connection that's required to manage and optimize fulfillment at the edge closest to the customer so that not only is the customer experience optimized, but the fulfillment can be handled in an efficient and cost-effective manner. There's a lot of integration happening at the edge, both at the stores and some of the DC experience is being pushed out to the stores for in-store fulfillment. So your distribution center is now not just the warehouse, but that distribution center is being extended out closer to the endpoints where uh, the customers are appearing. And being able to integrate the process of whether an order goes out to the DC or out to a more local store is important. It basically involves taking control of that operation at the order level and waving it out to the appropriate resources as an organization. And that means having visibility over the entire organization so that you can optimize that productivity. And that means paying attention to how things are supported 
both at the app level, on the mobile device edge, and the life cycle of those services that are being maintained uh, to support that operation. Uh, coincidentally, cloud-based applications have enabled management to work from home and remain connected to operations, especially critical during this time of COVID. So within the DC, what are we seeing? What are the symptoms and signs of flexibility, robustness, and resilience within the warehouse? Well, obviously they're maintaining visibility up to their products and their inventory with barcodes and RFID technology. Um, whether they've got dock doors to enable uh, ship confirmation uh, using RFID or they're using barcodes at the product, at the case, and at the pallet level to efficiently move that product throughout the enterprise. Um, they're making use of mobile computers to do this. They're using mobile devices on the floor and at the forklift to enable, empower, and um, keep those operations efficient, accurate, and connected. Um, for intelligent material handling, they're using automatic storage and retrieval systems where appropriate. Uh, they're doing goods to person fulfillment uh, with, with robots helping out, and they're using cobots to handle the put-away tasks or, or robots to handle the um, after the pick, bringing that up to the, the pack station. The whole idea is to focus on adding value that people provide and automate the mindless tasks and reduce travel times. By adding those types of features, that types of technology to your workforce and to your environment, uh, it enables you to flex and handle higher outputs um, and higher demands without having to increase your workforce. And using multimodal communications on those devices enables real-time alerts, voice-directed work, push-to-talk communications, and hands-free operations. If you can reach your workers where they are doing work to either enable them to work better or support them when things are going wrong or not as expected, uh, if they have the ability to reach back and contact technical support from that same device that they're using to scan product or to contact management to say, hey, I've got an exception, how do I process this? Um, you've suddenly increased their efficiency tenfold because now when things happen that are unexpected, they don't have to walk from wherever they're actually experiencing the problem to the front office, to the manager to find to explain what's going on. They can actually connect and show them in real time. And because these are smart devices, um, I can open up a Teams session at that device and they can share their experience by turning on their camera and show me exactly what they're seeing. I don't even have to be in the warehouse. I could be halfway across the country and still support the frontline workers. Um, Teams allows people to interact um, as an enterprise. A lot of different technologies can do that. Any device that allows you to have remote control and remote access to those devices um, is a wonderful thing within the warehouse because it enables real-time communications and improves that worker satisfaction. Overall, the ability to add operational intelligence to that adds resilience because now not only are you directing what's happening in the warehouse, you're able to actively monitor it predict and direct potential change to foresee problems before they happen and correct how things are going to happen. And there's a focus on continuous improvement. Um, I think the phrases that I've heard most recently are never settle and better than ever. This means pushing the approaches to accuracy and efficiency down to the worker levels so that they're always looking for ways of doing their job better. And you're giving them the tools to accomplish that. Now, let's talk a little bit about things other than just the mobile devices. Uh, we've talked about the, the process, we've talked about the people, we've talked about some of the technology, but we also have to talk about the data that supports all of this. Enterprises that are using GS1 standards have a shared vocabulary for collaboration within the supply chain. Um, that it gives them a standard for identification of all people, all things, all places, and all events within their supply chain something that they can share in both directions, not just one up and one down, but up the supply chain to allow their suppliers to see what their demand is like and down the supply chain so that they can get reflections of demand from their customers, from their end users, from people who buy from them and who buy from people who buy from them. This level of visibility allows the entire supply chain to become more resilient 
and able to adapt to change and be able to accommodate things that they could not accommodate before. Um, GS1 standards are revolutionizing a lot of what's going on within the supply chain and at the DC level. Being able to get products in the door that are already marked in a way that's internationally identifiable, that's standardized regardless of who you're getting your product from, means that you can standardize your operations based on those expectations. And likewise, everybody you ship to can support those same expectations and achieve those same types of efficiencies. So let's talk a little bit about that operational intelligence. Not only mobile devices, um, but pretty much everything in your warehouse uh, could be powered up to have access to the system via the Internet of Things. Your fork trucks, your equipment, um, all of the automation that you have in your warehouse is probably connected to the web in some way, manner, shape, or form. And getting visibility over all of that information allows you to make better changes and better decisions. Having visibility to all of those transactions and how they're happening um, allows you to learn from what's going on and learn how to do it better and give you actual data to make continuous improvement changes. Um, I've got customers who, shall we say, um, sometimes change is good, but sometimes it's change just for the sake of change. If you've got data, you can actually support a Six Sigma operation that says, this is what the baseline was, this is the change that we induced, and this was the improvement that was shown based upon that change. If you don't have the data, you can't make improvements. You can only make changes. You don't know whether or not they're improvements because you don't have a baseline to compare them to. Um, that's the supply chain geek getting up on his um, soapbox for today. I'll, I'll step back. <laughs> Peter um, added something prior to this, talking about uh, data that the device itself with all its, um, all its uh, sensors, it actually ca uh, captures and captivates um, passive data, which is, for the most part, never used, never transmitted, and is kept within the device. But using a tool like operational intelligence, you get access to that. As an example, you can use the device or operational intelligence to know how many times a device is dropped, how many times a device is thrown, um, which battery is getting weak that, you, that it needs to be replaced in a week, a month. And so there's also there, there's multitudes of data that you can reorganize and add algorithms to, to make predictive maintenance, predictive analysis, and, and improve your productivity by different means. So it's a very, what the device is generating as far as passive data is very, very valuable. I'm going to one up you on that one too, because what that device is generating as passive data allows us to look for stop gaps and errors within the operation. Um, so if I am Absolutely. having trouble getting a, uh, a response from my device as I'm tapping on a button, what is that caused by? Is that caused by my device being out of coverage? It's not in Wi-Fi? Is that being caused by the fact that there is a, a slowdown at the current switch that I'm uh, connecting to via Wi-Fi? Um, is it a problem back at the, um, you know, the cloud server where they've had a recent surge in activity and they're trying to adapt to that, that particular surge? Where is this um, transaction being slowed down? At, at the end point, at the end user's point, um, I see the slowness, but what's it caused by? Um, if I just report that, it's just an incident. But if you take a look at all the Internet of Things data behind that, taking that transaction all the way back to the ERP system, for example, you can actually tell from that incidental data where the problem is. And if you have visibility over that, you can actually start to resolve those problems in real time. Instead You can of, do that also by, I'm sorry, just you can also do that by comparing trends from one particular uh, site to another as well. Exactly, exactly. Um, a lot of times technical support is is more troubleshooting. It's like, well, if I can reproduce the problem, maybe I can figure out what it is. This level of data actually allows us to capture the incident 
and all of the associated transactions and uh, responses to that incident to see what the real problem is. Without having access to that operational intelligence, you're left to just troubleshooting. So let's kind of move on towards a wrap up mode. Um, because there's a lot of information that we've covered today. And having the right partners matter in being able to um, kind of navigate what is possible uh, within the technology, as well as um, what you need to do to move forward most efficiently and most effectively. Uh, the right partners do matter. And the main reason for that is you don't have to do this alone. Uh, the right partners help you understand where you are now, where you need or want to be, and the people, processes, technology, and data required to achieve that goal. They'll also help you manage how to ch manage that change from where you are now to where you want to be. And a good partner can help you collaborate with the stakeholders to clearly reflect what your current state is, clearly reflect what your goals are, and speak truth to the sea level. Now, the right partners can match you with the right solution and give you the right options and allow you to do that cost effective you know, return on investment analysis of if we go this way, it's going to cost X. If we go this way, the benefits are Y. And more importantly, we're also going to help you manage and deploy that solution, handling all of the updates, managing, helping you manage that user experience, um, dealing with the joys of remote support and thin IT. Um, one of my professors always said, uh, when we, he was talking about technology, he said, if IT doesn't have to do everything, then IT can do anything. And that alludes to the fact that startups of new projects are extremely labor and IT intensive. If you can leverage your partners to help you manage that lift, um, you don't have to do it all by yourself, and then you can take over it once it's been lifted into place. A, a quality, credible partner uh, can help you provide access to experts that you might not otherwise have access to. So we've been talking today about the right enabling technology and how that can help you handle volatility and change. Uh, we've covered things from the joys of COVID and how that's impacting operations, not only uh, within the DC and the warehouse, but also across all of our experiences um, as health and safety concerns come to the fore. And we've talked about the fact that digital transformation accelerated by the onslaught of COVID. Uh, this black swan event has basically exposed all of the weaknesses in the supply chain and uh, given us uh, enough encouragement to start making changes and start making improvements to our systems so that we can better handle that volatility and be more resilient, be more flexible, and, and survive these changes and thrive from them. So I'm going to hand this off uh, for a little bit to Bertrand. talk about barcode in Canada. Thank you. So uh, just a quick slide to uh, to just uh, present you barcode in Canada. And uh, barcode in Canada is part of barcode in US who has been in business for uh, more than 28 years. And it was uh, the natural extension for uh, barcode in US to come to barcode in Canada. And it's part of how we want to better support our uh, our customers. We had more and more customers uh, in Canada doing business in the US and in the US doing business in Canada. And Barcode in Canada was born on the fact that, you know, we need to be able to uh, follow uh, our customer supply chain. So uh, we started Barcode in Canada last year and uh, we are present across uh, across Canada from uh, Montreal to, uh, to Vancouver. And uh, with uh, the help of, uh, of team members like uh, Peter, we want to be 
uh, you know, uh, a complete uh, uh, solution-oriented uh, partner and work in partnership with, uh, with our uh, customers and uh, also uh, partner ecosystem. Uh, Peter has mentioned, you know, different uh, components to have a successful uh, distribution center operation. Uh, it's hardware, it's services, it's consulting, it's uh, software. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, we can provide uh, solutions uh, gathering all those uh, components. So uh, you see now uh, backcoding Canada and backcoding, uh, backcoding US. So we are true North American. And our objective is able to, is to, to, to be able to uh, to really support uh, you know the growth of uh, our customers in um, in North America. And kind of speaking to that, Bertrand, um, one of the things that we've uh, undertaken recently, um, we, we always like to get on site and and view you know what our customers are seeing and see what their challenges are. And under COVID, that becomes a little bit more of a a problem because they don't really want to allow strangers on site uh, in their environments or in country well, or in country for that matter yeah <laughs> um, we've actually been able to do remote assessments uh, using mobile devices and teams uh, to do a collaborative walkthrough of what that environment is like and what opportunities are available to make improvement um, with uh, the, the partners as well as the, uh, the customer on site at and it's been just a wonderful experience I was actually kind of uh, surprised at how smoothly it went. Um, we were able to do an on-site assessment for a major distribution center um, out in the Midwest in about two and a half hours of just on time, spending time using the, the phone and, and looking at things and asking questions back and forth. We didn't have to pay for flights. I didn't have to put on a bunny suit, um, no safety goggles and no safety shoes. Um, and they had the least amount of impact to their environment because they didn't have to disturb their workers. Um, everybody was COVID secure. Uh, they were able to maintain social distancing and physical safety. And we were still able to see everything we needed to see within that environment to help them make uh, concrete changes to what they're doing. Uh, Michael, I'm gonna pass it back to you to so get some customer audience questions. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, that was a lot of great information and certainly a timely topic. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that came in. Um, I'll ask our panelists and leave it up to you to decide who who's best suited to answer them. Uh, the first question we have is, what are you seeing in terms of improved systems? Are DCs implementing new ERPs with native warehouse execution systems or integrating a best-in-class warehouse management system to existing structure? Oh, I'm gonna to try to keep my answer short because that can be a, a fairly deep topic. I would say what I've seen is that customers that are experiencing severe and extreme growth uh, on the order of a, a 10 times scale, are switching from whatever ERP system they're in to a more modern ERP that has warehouse execution and, and WMS features kind of built into it. Um, they're, they're stepping up from QuickBooks and jumping in with the big boys right off the bat. Uh, for existing systems, uh, existing uh, distribution centers, they're often going to a bolt-on because they can't uh, afford the organizational change to um, effectively upgrade their ERP system and implement a new WMS. So they're doing it stepwise by adding warehouse management functions um, as a bolt-on to their existing system and maintaining close integration so that they get that real-time experience. That's what I've seen uh, most recently. Okay, great, thank you. We've got another question here. Uh, cloud apps and web-based apps can run on consumer-grade devices. Are the industrial devices still relevant? I would say uh, that the industrial devices are still relevant because they've got more features kind of built into them under the hood um, that are baked into the device. But I'm gonna let Rock speak to that one for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so this we have, 
uh, this question comes up all the time and we have white papers and ROI calculators. When acquiring any equipment, you can't only consider the cost of acquisition. You have to consider the cost of how much that equipment is going to cost you over the time of its uh, of its use. So typically between three to five, six years. So if you consider that, then there are several aspects to ruggedness. Obviously, the ability to withstand a harsh environment, cold environment, very hot, very uh, wet or humid environments, et cetera. Um, but there's also, so there's that fact to consider. <clears throat> and there's also uh, several other factors that I won't get into now, but I'll give you an example just to illustrate uh, what should be, you, which should, you, you should be considering uh, if you're considering consumer grade device versus a rugged device. The devices that among other manufacturers that Honeywell builds are typically adapted to very specific tasks. So it's a task oriented device, even though the insides are very, very similar to today's smartphones. You'll have, for example, you'll have peripherals uh, such as barcode scanners integrated, and you'll have all kinds of tools like operational intelligence, like smart talk uh, that turns your device into a, um, unified communication device. So you can use it as a regular phone uh, transiting through your PBX. You can use it as a cellular, you can text, you can video conference, all this with your rugged device while you're in your own environment. Uh, that is, it could be outside, it could be inside a freezer, a warehouse, it could be outside on the road, it could be in a, in a truck or car, et cetera. So it is really adapted to the environment and the purpose of the device. The one thing to ask yourself if you're considering either a consumer device or a built for purpose slash more rugged device, more feature rich device, is what does it cost you when that device goes down? What is that cost? So that'll give you an indication of how important is it that your device be running all the time. And I think that's the best way to assess if you should be taking and using a consumer grade device as opposed to uh, a rugged device. And the last thing I'll say is if a, for example, if a, I don't know, an iPhone costs you, uh, costs the company $300 and a rugged device will call it cost you $1,200. So that's four times the cost. But what happens if that, that iPhone is dropped in a puddle of water, for example, while a person is performing their duties on the road. So they either have to go back, get another device, or just entirely stop their delivery run, for example. So how much does that cost to the company when one of those edge devices goes down? And that's the best advice I can give. And in some cases, it won't be a rugged device that is needed, but in a lot of cases, it will be. And I've seen situations where a rugged device may not be needed, but the uh, requirements of the enterprise um, are better served by a, a device that's a little bit more industrial. And, and the reason for that is, like you said, devices get broken. Devices need repair. Um, devices need to be expanded. I started off with five. Next year, I need 10. Well, those next five consumer grade devices are not going to be identical to the first five. Um, you now are dealing with possibly a different OS, a different revision of that OS, possibly even different hardware completely. And it's going to respond differently. In some cases, it might be faster. In other cases, it may have additional features on there that you didn't realize you were paying for that are getting in the way of the experience. Very you get point. a more standardized experience from an industrial device because it's meant to give you the same user experience across that slate across that 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 fleet of devices and that's invaluable um i don't know how many times i've seen workers who have a quote unquote favorite device because it happens to be the, the newest one um as opposed to just grabbing one from the fleet because they're all identical um, that newest device sometimes gets put into a locker where no one else can use it because they're trying to reserve that for their own functionality that type of issue kind of goes away um, when you've got a standardized fleet. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, that wraps up our questions. Um, 
So I think at this point, uh, I'd like to just say thank you to our panelists, uh, Peter, Bertrand, and, and Rock, for sharing their time and expertise today. I'd also like to thank our audience for taking the time to listen in. Uh, you should all receive a recording of the webinar in your inboxes in the next uh, day or two. Uh, if you don't, uh, please let me know, and uh, I'll make sure that you get one. You can you can reach out to me at uh, michael at supplypro.ca. So with that, uh, thanks again for listening, and. Uh, have a great rest of your day and say stay safe and well. Uh, thank you everyone from Barcoding and Barcoding Canada. Thank you from Honeywell. <laughs>